message that I have today for us is tuning into God's wavelength. While I was preparing this message, uh, this week has been quite interesting. So, you know, when you are preparing something, God's word is like a sword. It cuts you first before it goes to others. And while I was preparing, before I got into this message, little did I know that God is going to teach me things that I'll share with you. So the first thing what happened last week was that, you know, I, I have this tradition in my family that in the morning but between 9 and 10, I take Avishai and we both go to the beach. We take a walk if it's a good weather. If it's, it's really nice, I'll just hold his hand and we just run around like wild. And that day, it was a bit windy and I thought that Avisha needed uh, really good heavy jackets to keep him warm. And my wife, uh, uh, she said, no, he doesn't need that. Uh, he needs something very light. It's, it's, it's not that cold outside. So, so don't uh, put warm jacket. So that's how it all started. Uh, <laughs> you know what, where it, is, it was going to lead into. I said, no, uh, it is cold. You, have you been outside? Have you checked how it feels like? She said, no, I have been outside and it's not that cold. So he needs just a light jumper and that should be fine. Well, I took the warm jacket as well. And I put on the light jumper upon him and I said, all right, thank you. We'll, I'll just put that one on. Later on, when I went and I changed it, I put the other one, which I, <laughs> I, I wanted. <laughs> I put the little bit, that was a bit thicker. So I, I put that on to Avishai and he's still sitting in the car. We are driving and along the way he starts crying. <laughs> and I'm just, what's going on? Why are you crying? And I realized his cheeks were very red. And I'm just wondering, I, it's not cold. He, he looked a bit hot, actually. And that's when I realized that actually my wife was right. That <laughs> she was right. It wasn't that cold. We weren't on the same wavelength. We weren't on the same page. And then another thing happened. She was cooking and um, I have this, I don't know whether you call it good habit or bad habit. While she's still cooking and the pot is still on the stove, if it is smelling nice, I would just go around and just take a spoon and just dig into and just eat. And uh, if she's around, she would just give me a smack. <laughs> and if she's not around, I just love it because then I can just uh, dig into it and enjoy. And that day, it was really, really nice and it was smelling good. So. I went there in the kitchen and I got my spoon, I tasted it, and apparently I felt that there wasn't enough salt. There wasn't enough salt. I didn't add Tom, I should have, but if I did, if I did, I would have got into a, even a bigger trouble than what I got into. So anyway, <laughs> anyways, she comes and I, I, I tell her that did you check? There is not enough salt. And that's it. It started again. That she said, do you realize it's still on the stove? <laughs> and it's still getting cooked. And by the way, before you criticize me, at least think about appreciating a bit. That yes, I'm cooking. And there you go. Before I was like, I just stopped there because I would have ended digging the hole a little bit deeper even. So I just apologize. I said, man, it just tastes yum. It tastes, she said, no, don't say that because you have already said how it tastes. <laughs> so so don't, don't say that it tastes yum. That's okay. And we hugged each other and uh, it was all right. I was appreciative of her cooking, but it's just that we weren't on the same page. That's how it is. She thought that I was very critical. I didn't appreciate what she's doing. I have gone straight away and I've said that, oh, 
there's not enough salt instead of saying thank you for cooking. Uh, how do we get on the same wavelength, on the same page? It's a journey. Uh, we've been married almost now, 2005. By the way, Ankush is here. He's recently married. Uh, some lessons there, brother. One day we were sitting in the car, <laughs> my wife and I, and I don't know, I was just reading on internet and I started, you know, chatting with her and I said, you know what? We should really look at our budgeting. Wrong place to talk. In the car. Don't talk about money in the car because the rest of your journey is going to be like, it's going to be miserable. Those who are married, please stop talking in the car about money. So, she said, so, so what are you saying? Are you saying that I've been spending more? No, I said, no, I am not saying we are spending more. I'm just saying, let's relook at how, how we are spending and how we are budgeting and how things are going. Have a bit of plan in regards to finance. And uh, it took us a while to get on the same page. And, you know, money is... is a contentious thing when you when you start talking about it. It's tough to get on the same page. So <laughs> the message today I wanted to share with and God really taught me these lessons. And just in last one or two weeks, while I was preparing the message and uh, I was having this study with uh, Serena and uh, Megan and uh, that's how this, this message also like that triggered while we were studying Mark chapter 8. So how do we get on the same wavelength with Lord? How do you tune into God's wavelength? Uh, it's a very, very practical question, by the way. And uh, the story, the, the passage that we're going to look at is from the Gospel of Mark. And we will look at chapter 8. But just before we look at that chapter, I wanted to give you a little bit of run through the background and the context of it. So please go to Mark chapter 8, and we will spend a little bit of time, and we will look at a number of things. There are two cases we're going to look at in Mark chapter 8, and then we'll go to some other passages as well, and, and we'll look at some cases, uh, the relationship which disciples had with Jesus, okay? So let's go to Mark chapter 8. Now, so far, just before we go there, my team is going to share with us a slide. We'll go to our first slide. You've got a map here. Jesus is no more in Capernaum. You remember some weeks ago, I shared with you a series on the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Miracles. And that was very much Jesus is all around Galilee and Capernaum. But this time, Jesus is getting out of that region, which was very much uh, occupied by Jewish people. This time, Jesus is going out into the area where Gentiles live. So Jesus is going into Tyre, then from there onwards to Sidon, and then he's going to go back to Bethsaida through Galilee. And then he comes to uh, Decapolis. So, so this all area, as you can see in the map, it is, it is occupied by the Gentiles. And that's where Jesus goes. You remember one of the miracles which Jesus did in Gedara, the one who was demon-possessed. He was healed by Jesus and he lived in Gedara. And Gedara was the capital of Decapolis. Decapolis, uh, the meaning of Decapolis is the city, uh, the place of 10 cities. Deca is 10. So 10 cities were part of this region. And that's where Jesus goes. And Jesus, Jesus like healed uh, people there as well. First one was the one who was demon possessed. And by the way, the testimony and the story of that person made the way for Jesus to come again after 10, 9 months. First time when Jesus came, they kicked him out. They didn't want him in Decapolis because of loss of pigs and economy was disturbed as a result of that. People just wanted him to get out of that place. And after that, that man who was healed, he remained back. And we believe that man, that man went around and he 
he witnessed to others he shared his testimony with others and that is how jesus later on comes after about nine ten months and he performs miracle here he feeds about four thousand people in decapolis and then from there he goes to Dalmanuta. that's the place where jesus uh, met with pharisees who wanted to have a sign sign that you are a prophet and jesus just sighed and he said how many signs do you guys need that will satisfy your curiosity that i am the son of god i was really unhappy with the question so after being there for a while jesus makes journey and they they leave for another place which is bethsaida so the the thing that the, the story is taking place the one which we are looking at is somewhere between dalmanuta and bethsaida this is this is where the story is taking place in within that region just to give you a bit of context the time is we'll go to the next slide the time is somewhere between 30 to 31 ad it's been almost like two years or so almost two years or perhaps a little less than two years the disciples have been with jesus and they have witnessed many miracles they have lived with him, ate with him, walked with him, talked with him. Now, they should have known who Jesus is by now, at least a little bit. Still, they are trying to figure out who Jesus is. So, they have lived uh, with him for a while. So, let's jump into our first passage, which is Mark chapter 8, verses 14 to 21. This is what it reads, and, and please stay with me because... You're going to laugh as well, and uh, there is a bit of sadness in this passage, but you will laugh as well what, what happens in this passage. So stay tuned as we run through this passage. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, <coughs> except one loaf. And this happens after Jesus has fed 4,000 people. By the way, the difference between Jesus feeding 5,000 people and Jesus feeding 4,000 people is this. The miracle that took place that Jesus fed 5,000 was somewhere in the region where Jews lived, which was somewhere around Galilee. The miracle Jesus performed by feeding 4,000 people, that happened in Decapolis among Gentiles. And the, the miracle that happens, like Jesus is feeding 5,000 people, you've got five loaves and two, two fish. On the other hand, the miracle of Jesus feeding 4,000 people, you've got seven loaves, and it doesn't mention how many fish they had. A few fish. And Jesus multiplies that, and they had seven baskets full of bread left over. Now, as they are journeying, they are in the boat, and Jesus starts talking with them. So the conversation that we are looking at, it happens between Jesus and his disciples at their journey. So the disciples had forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf. They had seven baskets left of food left over, but they just bring one loaf. I wonder why. They had with them in the boat, be careful, Jesus warned them, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. It's an interesting story. I was, while I was preparing this message, I was wondering why would you bring one loaf? Let's imagine that you've got about 12 of them in the boat. Probably they thought, well, he has multiplied 5 into feeding 5,000. He has multiplied 7 into feeding 4,000, 7 loaves of bread. Maybe we'll just take one. Let him multiply that as well, and we'll, we'll just eat. Perhaps that could be the reason. Or perhaps they just didn't care. But what happens next is interesting. So Jesus, Jesus tells them that watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and Herod. Now Jesus is talking about that be careful about the teachings of the Pharisees. Be careful about the teachings or the lifestyle that Herod lives. As yeast uh, permeates a lump of dough, so the principles we accept permeate our lives. Now, Jesus was trying to warn his disciples that be careful what principles you pick 
from all around you. You've got Pharisees who are full of hypocrisy, who are full of uh, pride, ostentation, and formalism. And Jesus said, be watchful, be very careful of their yeast, their teachings, their lifestyle. And uh, also be careful of the lifestyle that Herod is living so that that does not become part of your living. So that's what Jesus was talking with his disciples. He said, be watchful of the yeast of the Pharisees and Herod. Now what happens next? That is very interesting. So let's go to the next passage. And that says, they discussed with one another and said, it is because we have no bread. You should have laughed now if you got the point. Now Jesus is talking about that. Be careful about the yeast of Herod and Pharisees. And disciples are thinking that now Jesus is probably talking about because they have forgotten to bring bread. I wonder how did they reach that can conclusion that Jesus is talking about the bread, whereas Jesus is talking about yeast of the Pharisees and Herod. The connection I'm thinking, could it be that the Pharisees and Herod, somehow they had some connections with the yeast for baking the bread. Or perhaps they had some sort of business in selling the bread. So straight away, as soon as Jesus talks about that, be careful of their yeast. Disciples, they say, man, he's talking to us because we have forgotten to bring the bread. They're not on the same page. Jesus is talking about something else. Disciples are thinking about something else. They are more thinking about like worldly temporal things. Like they're, they're still on the bread. They have already seen 5,000 being fed. They have already seen Jesus feeding 4,000 people. And they are still thinking that Jesus is address, addressing the shortage of bread. They couldn't see beyond that. So definitely, this passage tells me that they weren't on the same wavelength. The way Jesus thinks is not the way disciples are thinking. They're not connecting. They're not on the same page here. And no wonder Jesus has to give them really good lecture. Jesus has to really connect with them and talk and help them out. But before we go there, Message Bible, it, it says, Meanwhile, the disciples were finding fault with each other because they had forgotten to bring bread. So it was way more than just like, hey, we have forgotten bread. This, the, instead of listening to what Jesus is talking about, they start fighting with each other. They start arguing with each other. Maybe first one was Peter. Peter telling to James or John that you should have picked one of the baskets or just brought some loaves. And now we are, like Jesus is talking about, that you should you should have been careful about the yeast of the Pharisees and Herod. So they begin to fight with each other. And they have completely missed the point here. Jesus goes ahead and he tells them what he is trying to tell. Through that, uh, like they have to be careful about the yeast of the Pharisees and Herod. In verse 17, chapter 8, it says, Aware of their discussion, <laughs> Jesus figured out that, yes, yeah, something is happening there. So I better now clarify things to these people. He said to them, why are you thinking about having no bread? I can almost imagine Jesus shaking his head and thinking, come on, guys, why, why are you thinking about bread? I'm not even talking about bread. And then Jesus actually says that in this passage, do you still not see or understand? You've been with me almost more than a year, almost somewhere close to two years, and you still, it seems like, don't see and understand what's happening. And then he continues another question, are your hearts still hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear and don't you remember when I broke five loaves for the five thousand how many baskets of pieces did you pick <laughs> instead of being I don't know whether Jesus really wanted answer for that from the disciples and in this story 
you see they are quite bold in responding to Jesus. Yeah, we do remember that. Yeah, it was 12 baskets we picked up. And then Jesus said, all right, okay, so it seems like your memory is still fine. You still remember that what I performed a miracle and I fed 5,000 people. And the next you see is, and when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many baskets of, basketfuls of uh, pieces did you pick up? And disciples, they answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? Do you still not understand that I'm not talking about bread here? I have fed 5,000, I have fed 4,000, and even if you brought just one loaf of bread, I would have multiplied it for you too. So don't fight. Try to understand what I am telling you. They weren't on the same page. How often we do practice selective Christianity. It's, uh, disciples, they did remember some of the details, by the way. They, their memory was fine. Uh, many times we are like disciples as well. We practice selective hearing. We practice uh, selective Christianity that, okay, I'm going to pick on whatever suits me and keeps me comfortable. I'll be happy with that. And Jesus keep on talking. I'm listening. But all right, give me that. I'll put that into my basket. And yeah, that a little bit uncomfortable with that. Let's throw that out. I don't want to hear that. Uh, maybe that one I'll take into my life. I can handle that. But probably that teaching that you've got, I can't really handle it. So I'll chuck that away. There are times we uh, practice selective hearing and selective Christianity. There are things sometimes that make us uncomfortable and we are not really comfortable accepting those things and teachings of Jesus. I want to take you to another case. And that's second case that will show us how disciples are journeying with Jesus. It's in the same chapter in uh, verses 31 to 38. It says, he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. <laughs> wow. I, I, man, Peter had guts. Jesus has been with them and Jesus has been leading them out. And this guy, as soon as Jesus begins to explain things, that this is what's going to happen to me, Peter isn't really comfortable with what Jesus is saying. The reason is because Peter, all this while, has been thinking that he is the one, he is the Messiah, he is the king who is going to offer us freedom from the captivity or the bondage from this Roman people. And as soon as Jesus begins to share with Peter and other disciples the real picture, the real Messiah, the real Savior he is, Peter is not comfortable with that picture at all. So Peter, straight away, because he's not comfortable with that, he takes Jesus a little on a side and he begins to you shouldn't be talking like that. That's, that's not what's going to happen. I wonder what sort of words Peter used. Just giving it a touch of imagination. Probably he hugged Jesus and probably he whispered in his ears. I don't know. But he rebuked Jesus for talking like this to other disciples and to him. And what happens next, you're going to again say, whoa. Verse 33, verse 33 in chapter 8, it says, But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, Jesus first, while Peter is talking with Jesus like this, it's, 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 just imagine that Peter and Jesus, they're talking with each other, okay? And Peter has just now rebuked Jesus. 
And then Jesus obviously must have looked at Peter and then he turns his eyes and he takes a glance over his other disciples. And probably those, they, they were also looking at, man, Peter has got to say something like that to Jesus. And Jesus turns around and he looks at other disciples. And after that, Jesus turns back and he looks at Peter. And I don't think Peter ever expected that coming to him. <laughs> Verse 33. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked who? Peter. Jesus rebuked Peter and he, he said to him, Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Wow, strong words. Get behind me, Satan. You do not have things of God in mind. You've got things of men. Whatever you are thinking, that's not how God sees things. Peter, fix it up. It's been a while now we've been together. But it was more in a loving tone. Why do I say that? Let's go to, uh, we have Ellen Why She helps us to understand this a little bit more. She gives this a little bit more, uh, like she, she shares how things may have happened. The words of Christ were, this is what she says, the words of Christ were spoken not to Peter, but to the one who was trying to separate him from his Redeemer. Get thee behind me, Satan. No longer interpose between me and my erring servant, which is Peter here. Let me come face to face with Peter that I may reveal to him the mystery of my love. I personally believe that Jesus is addressing both Peter plus. Satan. Obviously, Satan is the mastermind behind this all. Satan is the one using Peter as an instrument to discourage Jesus. And when Jesus realizes that straight away, Jesus addresses the issue. And then after that, also helps Peter to understand that, Peter, now you need to wake up. We've been together for long enough and you need to know who I am. And you remember just uh, maybe two weeks ago, we had a message on Peter's first love. And that gave us a little bit of insight into Peter. Peter is someone like that. Later on in Acts, you see that Peter is the first one to preach the message of gospel to many people. And many people accepted that message. So, then Jesus uh, goes on after, after talking to Peter. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples, and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his own soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels. Wow. He addressed this. Go back to in the beginning of this passage. It says, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples. Jesus shared with Peter that, Peter, that's what's going to happen to me. And it almost was like that Peter was really ashamed of that this cannot really happen to you. You are not going to be crucified. You're not going to be mocked upon. You are going to be the king who is going to redeem us. He was feeling a little bit shameful that Jesus could talk like that about himself. And then Jesus addresses him by saying that whoever is ashamed of me today, I will be ashamed of him tomorrow. 
Very interesting. This actually really talks to me very directly that am I ashamed of Jesus? Am I ashamed of talking about him? Am I ashamed of having him as part of me? It's, uh, it's, it's really important message for us. That if we are ashamed of him today, then tomorrow he will be ashamed of us as well. So that was the second case where Peter is not really on the same wavelength with Jesus. And journey with me. You will see that, all right, we have seen that all disciples, they weren't really on the same wavelength with Jesus. And then now we have looked at Peter who is not really on the same wavelength with Jesus. And the next one we're going to look at is Luke chapter 8, verses 42 to 46. It says, as Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. You know that story. We covered that story some time ago. And uh, Jesus said to his disciples and everybody that someone has touched me. Someone has touched me. Jesus said that. And knowing that Peter is the spokesperson for all the disciples and everyone, Peter goes ahead and straight away, what does he say? That, Come on, you are saying that someone has touched you? You've been crushed from all sides. You've got so many people all around you. And you are talking about that someone has touched you. I wonder whether Jesus really wanted Peter to answer that question. Or was it just... To bring to light something that, that was to do with the faith of that woman. But Peter, he thinks after. He talks before. And, and that's what he did. He said, there you go. Now you're saying that someone has touched you. Everybody is just pushing from all corners, all sides. I wonder when Jesus looked at Peter, what sort of look that was. <laughs> Peter... <laughs> This, this appeared to be hopeless case, but I'll still work with that, you know, that person. Because this is in Matthew chapter 27. Uh, is, is it Luke chapter 8? Yeah. Oh, Matthew 27? No, we are in Luke, Luke 8. So that is before uh, what happens, uh, what we have seen in Mark chapter 8, where Jesus is talking with Peter, and Peter said, that shouldn't happen to you. So this story takes place before that. Just to put the context right. So here again we find Peter is not at the same wavelength with Jesus. Jesus is talking more about faith and belief. And Peter is talking about more like what you see and not what you don't see. Peter is not really thinking like Jesus. Peter is not really hearing what Jesus is talking. He can focus on the words but not understanding the words. Fourth case, and that's our last one. Matthew chapter 27, verses 45 to 50. That's when Jesus was upon the cross. And this is how it reads. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in loud voice. Eli, Eli, or Eloi, Eloi, lama shabkatni. It was... Uh, in, in a language that was familiar for the people at that time. So Jesus is crying out this, Eli, Eli, lama shabkatni. Or you can also say, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabkatni. When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he is calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with the wine vinegar, but it... Uh, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. It's, it's, it's really sad that just after that cry, Jesus gave up his spirit. Jesus died. We'll go to the next quote, and that would help us to understand uh, what's going on here? 
It says here, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama shafkatni. That is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These words could not be misunderstood. People knew what those words meant. They weren't like strange words to those people. They knew what those words were. They understood what Jesus was saying. But the priests and the rulers framed them to suit their own understanding. With bitter contempt and scorn, they said, he calls for Elias or Elijah. And that's what people started saying, oh, he's calling for Elijah. As soon as the priests and the, and the rulers, they said, oh, that, he's calling for Elijah. Whereas Jesus was talking about something else, rulers interpreted it in such a way that it would suit their purpose. And again, we find that people buy into that. Rulers aren't on the same page with the Lord. People aren't on the same wavelength with the Lord. And he gave up his spirit and he died. Sad ending that he lived for almost three years, and still there were people who really didn't get onto the same wavelength, really understanding who he is. And even his own disciples, they weren't on the same wavelength with him. On the day when he was caught by the soldiers, they ran away, scattered. But this is where the good news is. Let's look at one more passage. This is where the good news is. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 44 they devoted, and these are the believers. Jesus has already died, and he has resurrected, and he has already gone to heaven. So Acts, that, this is the passage we are looking at, the context of this passage. Quickly wanted to share with you. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. Verse 44, and that's what amazes me, by the way, this morning. All the believers were together and had, had everything in common. Now, this is where it, it just amazes me because they were very much of one mind and very much connected and united praying together. They were on the same wavelength. They were on the same page here during Pentecost. In that upper room. That's when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. I asked this question to myself. And I saw that passage. That how did these disciples. These people. Journeyed from where they were. To that stage. In the book of Acts. We have seen before. They were fighting about bread. Where Jesus, whereas Jesus is talking about the teachings of the Pharisees. They are talking about the loaf of bread. Then we have seen Peter understanding that Jesus is going to be actually the king who is going to redeem them from Roman captivity, whereas Jesus was talking about him being the savior for the world to save them from the sin. And later on we find Jesus is talking about the touch of faith, and Peter is talking about everybody just pressing him from all sides. And then towards the end when Jesus was upon the cross, Jesus is talking about my father, why father, my father, why have you forsaken me? And people, they interpreted it, it, that, that he's calling for Elijah to save him. Did he need the Savior? If he needed the Savior, he would have called a long time ago. He didn't need anyone to come and save him. He himself is the Savior. That was the biggest ever heresy that was preached by the rulers and the priests, that he's calling for Elijah to save him. Declaring that he was not really the king, he's not really the savior. And now, we have some of the believers and disciples, they're on the same page. So how did the journey there? I have three points to share with us, and then we will finish today. Number one. Number one point is, set your mind on things above. For us to be tuned into God's wavelength, we have to set our mind upon things that are above and not upon this earth. 
Colossians chapter 3 verse 2, it says, Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Yes, we need to pay our bills. Yes, we need our jobs. Yes, we need to run our houses and families. But we must have God's things as the center of everything. Number two, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not conform to what's happening around us, although it's very tempting, by the way. And that's uh, talking to our young people as well. Very, very tempting. Very tempting what's going around us. And Apostle Paul says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his uh, will is his good, pleasing and perfect will. Then we will be able to sense what is God's will? What is he wanting? What is his purpose? What is his goal? How is he thinking? Then we may get onto that wavelength where we can understand what, the way God thinks. The third point is this. Before that, John chapter 10, verse 21, uh, 27, it says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. That's what, when you are on the same wavelength, you hear and you do what? You follow. That is where Jesus wants us to be. Because if we are his sheep, we have to learn to tune into his wavelength. The last point is this. Gird the loins of your mind. Now, man, when, when I looked at that, I said, oh, what's that? Gird the loins of your mind. That's in the passage, actually, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. It says, wherefore, girding up. The loins of your mind be sober and set your hope perfectly on the grace that is to be brought on, uh, unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I said, how do you gird the loins of your mind? So I said, well, let me just go to the Greek language. And I thank God that I do know Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic and so forth. So I went into the original language and I wanted to understand what is he talking about. We'll go to the next slide. It's the word that is used is Anna. Zonemai. That's the Greek word that is used here. And that Greek word, the word for girding up, the word is used, ana zonemai. And it, it, it means be ready to learn, prepare for action, formally gird, bind the loins of the mind, culturally equal to roll up your sleeves for mental action. Before anything comes and hits you, Roll up your sleeves and be ready to respond. In other words, the moment you are about to hit on the computer button, roll up the sleeves of your mind and be ready to action so that you don't end up on the wrong website. If you're mentally prepared already before you are pressing the computer and you tell yourself mentally that, Lord, as soon as I open this computer, I don't want to end up in the wrong, wrong website and watching things which I shouldn't be as a Christian. That's girding up your mind. When you are meeting someone you don't like, tell yourself, thank you, Lord, please, I want to gird up my mind. I don't want to see anything that is not like you. I don't want to see anything or say anything that does not represent you. Lord, please help me gird my mind help me roll up my sleeves for my mental action lord when i'm driving out there i'll see many drivers who drive like what i i don't have a word to explain but lord help me <laughs> to roll up the sleeves of my mind so while i'm out there i don't say the words that will I don't want to hear those words when I've said it. Help me, Lord. So that's girding up the loins of your mind. So, my friends, here's the question I want to leave with us. Are you 
tuning in to God's wavelength. Are you at the same wavelength with him? Do you hear what when he speaks? Because his sheep hears. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can come into your presence and thank you that you work with your people, you journey with them, just as you journeyed with your disciples and your followers, and we find them in the book of Acts praying together. They were of one mind and they were united in one spirit. And that's when you showered upon them your Holy Spirit. I pray for such mental condition for Garden City Fellowship that may we be united as one so that we can be on the same wavelength with you and we can hear what you speak to us. My Lord, personally, I pray that may you please help me and I pray the same for each individual present here so that we can tune into your wavelength. So when you speak, we can understand. When you show us, we can see. Help us, O oh Lord. Journey with us. Fill in and strengthen us. Because we are weak, but you are strong. And therefore, we rely upon you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.